Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 24 of Nostalgia Talk. Hope you're all having a great weekend. Today on Nostalgia Talk is a show that I know a lot of you have been very excited about for a while. I've been teasing it for the last few weeks, and I'm very happy to welcome Ricky Boyd. Hello. Nice to, well, I can't see everybody, but nice to uh, meet you, James, finally. James and I have talked for a long time in emails, but it's nice to finally see you face to face. Yeah. And on that note, I actually should give a few shout outs. Um, Ricky got in touch with me by a couple of people at Muppets that we both know. And I remember one morning, my mom is checking the family email. She's like, who is Ricky Boyd? And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, the Ricky Boyd? Because I know I knew who it was, but none of the rest of my family didn't. And so yeah. I was like, wait, I, I got an email from Ricky Boyd. And yeah. uh, he had written, I heard about you from Brian Meal and Tyler Bunch. And for anyone not aware, Brian Meal was a puppeteer on Sesame Street. He did Barkley, Telly, Noble Price, Grungetta, Elmo before he became Elmo. Mm -hmm. And Tyler Bunch is Elmo's dad, Louie, and was also on Bear in the Big Blue House. Mm -hmm. And so Ricky and I have kind of stayed in touch since then. And he's been quite a mentor to me in the film industry. Uh, he's one huh. of the first people that I... I went to for advice when I started thinking about going to film school and I've been working on a couple of projects and I swear that if I ever get a film on the big screen, whether he had anything to do with it or not, he's getting a credit, like special thanks, well, what have you. That's very kind. I don't get called the Ricky Boyd very much, so that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll need to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> now, for anyone not aware, Ricky is a Muppet performer and animator. For the Muppets, he did Dog City, a bunch of TV, which was a TV special for the Jim Henson Hour. Dog City, Song of the Cloud Forest. He was on Muppets from Space, Muppet Wizard of Oz, Muppet Vision, Muppets at Walt Disney World. He did Sesame Street. He did Cookie Monster's Grandma in Sesame Beginnings. And uh, if you're looking at the YouTube video, that picture there of the monkey puppet that Ricky is holding against the green screen is Waffle the Cow Monkey from Animal Jam, which is a show that I used to watch when I was a kid. That's cool. <laughs> and Ricky also is creative director for Magnetic Dreams Animation Studio, which has done, I checked your website before coming into this, mm -hmm. and you guys have done quite a lot. Like, I am amazed. A lot for Sesame Street, Nickelodeon, mm -hmm. Paw Patrol. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of kids who are obsessed with Paw Patrol. Mm -hmm. And my sister would kill me if I didn't say this. The music video for 15 by Taylor Swift. Oh, yes. Yeah, we've done quite a bit. Um, we, we, we started doing work for Sesame probably 15 years ago. And wow. uh, started doing uh, interstitial little animations. There was a character, a TJ and Bernie, a little kid in a wheelchair, and a dog that was on rollerblades. We started oh, doing yeah. those. And the, he was called Traction Jackson in the early days. And we uh, did we did maybe seven of those. I think they ran about two to three minutes each. And then gradually over time, we did more and more interstitials. We did animation for home videos. And then more and more we've done, um, we did the 3D twiddle bugs when those were, we did about five of those. Uh, we did, uh, now we mostly are doing effects for the show. And when they do specials, we, we do the effects in any 3D. Of course, we did uh, Elmo the Musical was a big one. I mean, that was a, a couple of years of work and a whole lot of 3D and characters and composite. And we have a very talented team at Magnetic Dreams. And, and uh, that was a very big job for us. And, and Super Grover 2.0. And let's see, the other one would be Crummy Pictures Productions. Uh, we, we did most of those. Wow. And Smart <laughs> Cookies as well. I smart think. Cookies, that's right. Yeah, yeah. we Which did was those. Very so which was almost very similar to crummy pictures. Yes. It was like Cookie Monster's take on James Bond, I always thought. Exactly. And those were a lot of fun to do. That They were fairly complex to shoot, which can be trying when you're a performer, when you're just on green screen. But it's uh, uh, when it all comes together, it, it looks in incredible. So, um, But we're still doing, right now, we're doing work for the uh, new season of not too late show with Elmo. We're doing some graphic effects for that. So we're working on that right now. Nice. And yeah. the not too late show with Elmo for anyone wondering what that is, it's streaming on HBO max. We don't get that here in Canada, but mm -hmm. if you're Canadian and want to see the not too late show, it's on treehouse TV. Okay. Cool. Thank, thank God I have some way of watching it. I was, yeah. <laughs> I did love seeing the Jonas brothers on it. Jonas brothers is one of my favorite bands of all uh -huh. time. So uh -huh. when I, when I did see that episode, I was like, nobody bother me. I'm watching the Jonas brothers. Yeah. 
like, cool. a, like a teenage girl in 2007, <laughs> except I'm a dude. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Um, so I, I had talked with you a couple of times about your, uh, your inspiration. And actually, Paul Rudolph, when I announced this oh, show, yeah. it was... When I announced this episode, it was when I had Paul Rudolph on the podcast, and he said, no spoilers, but Ricky has lots of great Jim Henson stories, many of which I've probably heard. But um, but uh, what was it about Jim Henson's work as a puppeteer that was such a big influence on you? Was it the Muppets, like on TV shows? Was yeah. it Well, I was, you know, I'm 56. I think I'm 56 <laughs> this year, year. So when I was a kid, uh, the, the Muppet show in the 70s, you know, I was about... 11 or 12 years old. So I would come home every night, it was syndicated. So uh, uh, I would come home and watch it on one of the, I li I'm from Georgia, so I was watching on the Atlanta stations. And I would come, and, and my viewing was, when I was younger, Sesame Street, Sesame Street was like twice a day. And then on the local PBS station. And then uh, when Muppets came out, that was just gangbusters. I can't remember what night it came on, but that was like, appointment viewing you know i just didn't miss it and uh you know there was no internet there was no way to record it and study it there was like you watched it right then that was before vcrs so you literally uh, i remember the the big thing now people don't understand is back in the day uh there there was one movie that would come out every year that everybody would wait to see and it was the wizard of oz the original wizard of oz would come out in the fall I just they, remember they, they, the, the one from the 30s, they re released yes. it every year. Well, they would show it on the networks. Otherwise, oh. you couldn't see it unless you went to a revival theater or there, there was no video. So, when I was really young, uh, you know, watching The Muppets and watching Sesame Street, what the fascination, I would watch Mr. Rogers and love Mr. Rogers, but I always was fascinated with the puppets on Sesame Street and was just confounded by how Ernie could pick things up, move both hands, and be so funny and so engaging, Ernie and Bert, and any of the characters. So I was fascinated, was very interested. I was always an artist as a kid. I was drawing and making things and trying to figure out how to animate. There just wasn't any Google back then. There was no way, and not many books. There were very few books on how to build puppets, How just nothing. I mean, it didn't exist. And um, so that was the real, thing and also Walt Disney was a huge Disney fan and Disney came on Sunday nights the wonderful world of Disney was seven o'clock Sunday nights and I would beg my mother to let me skip church at night to, to stay with my grandfather and watch <laughs> the wonderful world of Disney so I would go to church on Sunday morning and then Sunday nights if it had cartoons because it was back then the show some nights would be cartoons and then other nights would be some live action thing. And I could care less about that. But if it was animated, I was like, I'm staying home tonight. <laughs> and so that stuff, I just spent way too much time watching that Godzilla movies and Ray Harryhausen movies. So I was into all that stuff. Really? Godzilla? Oh yeah. I loved it. The old original Toho studios got the guy in a suit. Oh. That was a, because a local station in Atlanta had, um, I think it was called Science Fiction Theater. And my buddy and I would stay up again late at night, sleeping in a sleeping bag, eating chili and cheese toast, <laughs> waiting for Godzilla movies and watch Godzilla movies into the wee hours of the morning. Oh, man. It was crazy. So you said the Disney animation was a big inspiration on you. It kind of yeah. makes me wonder, what are some of your favorite Disney films? Oh gosh, that's tough because, I mean, as a kid, I was more of a Warner Brothers kid because I love Warner Brothers. But for the for the like the Disney shorts, I liked, but I really liked the Warner Brothers shorts. They were just so full of anarchy. But the feature films from Disney were like, you know, just Jungle Book, Robin Hood. I know some people don't like Robin Hood as much. The animators didn't seem to like it as much. I loved Robin Hood, you know, with the fox playing Robin Hood. Uh, and of course, all the, the, when they had their big revival with Little Mermaid and Lion King and all that, that was all great. But even way before that, uh, I was a huge fan. And in fact, when I was 10 or 11, uh, even younger, I, I wanted to be an animator. That was my original thing, even before the puppetry became more serious. 
And it turns out that there was a gentleman from my hometown, a little small town of Adairsville, Georgia, which is very Mayberry, little town right off the railroad track with the depot and the barbershop and the five and seven, ten, 10 cent store. I grew up with that. And it turns out my grandfather had a super eight camera and he taught me how to shoot single frame and do with my drawings. And I would, uh, draw he used to subscribe to reader's digest magazine and he had tons and tons of these little thick books you know but they had a really good margin that didn't have anything written on it so i would do flip books on his cool. on all of his reader's digest and they were usually very violent they were like two trains colliding or rockets you know or dinosaurs eating each other and he told me as he was he my grandfather never went to school to college, but he knew something about everything. And he, he said, you know, there was a guy from Adairsville that was an animator for Disney. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And it turns out a man named Paul Satterfield was at that time when I was only maybe 10, he was probably in his seventies or eighties by then. It turns out he was a sequence director on Bambi and oh, nice. on Fantasia. And he was sequence director on Fantasia's dinosaur sequence. And I was like, you've got to be, I love dinosaurs. So I was like, you got to be kidding me. And it turned out that he was going to be visiting a Dazzle at a local arts festival they have every year and was going to be the grand marshal of the parade. And my grandfather said, get your drawings together. We're going to meet him. So we go downtown to the big town of Adairsville, and they had a display of his artwork and a picture of him working with Disney. And oh, they, wow. he had a, a display with drawings and there was, they had these lap boards, these wooden board drawing boards with peg holes at the bottom to register the animation paper that they would use at Disney. And they had one of these into the, the display and he, he reaches in and takes the thing out of the display and hands it to me and he says, you keep this. So I still got it, let me see, hang on a minute. Oh, I forgot it right here. I'm just gonna get my earplugs back in. So this is it. And you can see uh, the registration, the paper, and then there's his name. Oh, wow. Uh, whoops, I got it upside down. Hang on, Paul Satterfield. And as a kid, I didn't know any better. So I drew on it myself and I got paint on it, but, which is terrible. But this very well may have been used at the original Disney Studios. I was wow. just fascinated with it. You've but, got quite a piece of art there. Yes. And uh, he was very encouraging. I was just a kid. And he said, just draw, draw, draw. Don't ever stop drawing. And then I got into building puppets. Uh, Shortly after that, I, I had a friend who, and I was not very good at it. I could sculpt, but I couldn't sew. So I would carve everything out of foam and paint it. I'd learned how to airbrush and I would paint over my sculptures, the bodies. And I'd get my girlfriend at later when I was a teenager and, and uh, who turns out to be my wife now in high school, <laughs> she would sew the bodies. And, um, but this friend of mine, his dad was the director at a local public access station. Now, before there used to be uh, TV stations that were very low budget, kind of local stations that did local programming. And this one was part of a local library in a neighboring town of Rome, Georgia. And he would let me and my buddy, we were probably 11, 12 years old, come into the studio, three pedestal cameras, full reign of the studio and let us build our own puppets and shoot our own shows. I mean, it was literally like someone handing two kids a million dollar studio and we would make our own shows and they were never aired, but we were beginning to learn working with monitors. And this was at 11, you know, and uh, continued to do that. They had a portable unit, uh, a video unit, because again, this was right before home video came out. So he, he would let us have all this heavy, clunky video equipment that we would take home and shoot. I would set up in my den, the dining room table, and I had a store-bought Grover puppet and a store-bought Ralph puppet. 
and we would do <laughs> the scenes like um, the old Grover restaurant scenes on video. And we were working with monitors, which was insane, wow. you know, at that age, but it was fun. And we just mainly did it for fun. I did super eight films, which, you know, were not very good, but at the same time, my grandfather built uh, an animation stand for me and I would put my camera in there and I could shoot either drawings or I could flip it on its side and put a stage in there and shoot clay dinosaurs. Oh, wow. So but did all of that. And then to make a long story short, uh, I ended up when I went to college in Rome, Georgia, I went back to the same studio I went to as a kid and did my internship, which is where I did local TV shows with puppets with two college buddies that got me the job at Henson. Nice. So it all came kind of full circle, but, but the, the, the initial, I think your question was how to get started, but it, the interest was really in animation. And then the puppetry, I began to build puppets and was just really loved the immediacy of it. You know, the animation is wonderful, but it's very slow. And uh, the immediacy of putting a puppet on and immediately being able to perform with it was really attractive and just a lot of fun, really. I bet. Yeah. That, is, that is an amazing story. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed. And you told me before that your first Muppet job was... Um, the sing along dance along do along video and for all yeah. of you die in the wool muppet fans out there like me not to be confused with the sesame street home videos sing along and dance along which is actually what i thought that was uh, when i had heard about those videos uh -huh. and then i actually went and watched them and i was like well that was disappointing it was there were good <laughs> videos but the yeah, dance along yeah. video that i had as a kid really was really interactive it was like a pre-version right. of animal jam That's true, uh, yeah. and you said that in the sing along dance along do along video you were do you were assisting a marimba pig what yeah. was your what was your very first speaking role with the muppets the first speaking role was very unusual because uh i had been up well, I'd gone up. It was a totally different story. I won't get into it unless you want to. But I had gone up and initially for the audition and ended up, they asked me to stay the next day to do this job. And I didn't know what it was. And it happened to be the sing-along, do-along tape. And so we did that. That was Roth the dog uh, and a bunch of his pigs in a, in a, at a luau playing instruments. So I assisted on that. Richard Hunt directed, which was cool. So I met Richard and and that was the first time I well, I'd met Jim at the audition, but the first time I really worked on set with him. But the next job they called me for, again, I lived in Georgia. And the way they did it back then, it's a little different now, but back then they told me, they said, look, uh, we don't ever know how much time there is between jobs. But right now, for now, you know, just stay where you are. And we'll call you and we'll pull you up and we need you. So the next call I got usually was about three months between jobs. I'd say two to three months and something would come up. And it would either be a day, it might be a week, it might be a month. If it was a movie, it was three months. So I continued to work in Georgia as um, I worked at the uh, at a local TV station. And then I would get a call. And one of those calls came in and they said, we want you to come up for two things. We want you to audition for the Jim Henson Hour. But while oh. you're here, while you're here, we want you to, uh, at the time, uh, Turner Network Television, which was known then as TNT, I don't think it exists anymore, had just uh, uh, started. And they were doing, they were going to be exclusive uh, home to The Muppet Show and Fraggle Rock. So Henson was shooting a commercial in which Kermit is in front of the Muppet Show curtain, the red curtain, and he's like, hi ho, you know, uh, Muppets are going to be on T TNT. And every time he said the word TNT, Crazy Harry would walk through pushing one of the letters. <laughs> and they asked me to do that. Now, that did two things. Everybody knows Crazy Harry is one of Jerry's classic characters from The Muppet Show, Jerry Nelson. Oh, yeah. And so when they asked me to do it, I was so new. I thought, well, Jerry must be sick or something. There must be something going on or he's unavailable. Something's going on. I didn't even ask. I was just like, okay. And so I went up and I remember I did the audition for this character for uh, Jim Henson Hour. And it turns out they like my audition, but they, they have a quota. You may know living in Canada. When you work in Canada, you have a quota of Canadian puppeteers you need to use versus 
the number of people you bring in. So Jim said, I can't bring you up for the whole season, but I can bring you in on special. So he brought me in on Dog City and he brought me in, I think Song of the Cloud Force was shot in New York, so that wasn't an issue. But at any rate, I finished discussing that and he says, you know who Crazy Harry is? I said, oh yes, of course. So he, he says, come with me and we go over to the corner and there's a box and he pulls out Crazy Harry. And Jim puts him on and he says, you know, he has this kind of slinky walk that he does. You know, he's just kind of creepy, slinky, loose walk. He said, oh, he said, be sure to do that. I said, okay. He said, go downstairs. They're ready for you. So I, I take Crazy Harry and I'm walking down. It's in the uh, old Henson, um, I think they call it Carriage House. It's a three-story uh, place with a small studio on the bottom. And so I go downstairs. They've got everything set up. Kermit, he's going to shoot Kermit later because it's all, this is all green screen oh, okay, with cool. Crazy Harry it was anyways. So I go downstairs and they attach, because he's pushing these giant letters, they would attach his hands to the letter and I couldn't get out of the puppet because once I'm in there, I can't come out because I'm literally attached to the letter. Oh, yeah. All, all I had to do was say, uh, uh, I think his line was, someone say TNT. That was the line. Someone say TNT. And then he would say power. There were certain words. Kermit would be in the foreground saying something and then Crazy Harry would walk through in the back pushing a letter and repeat one of his lines. And I remember Rita Perugi was a producer. Kevin Clash was there watching to make sure I didn't screw something up. But one of the weirdest things, they kept my voice on it. But the weird thing was during the middle of the take, I'm standing there literally stapled to the letter. And who looks in the door except Jerry Nelson? <laughs> so the door opens up and uh, Jerry Nelson looks in and looks at me like, who are you? And it closes the door and walks away. He never said anything. And I never said anything. So I don't know. He was very nice to me. But I'm That's always, good. to this day, I'm like, was he, did he approve that or not? It still worries me. <laughs> but that was technically my first speaking role. But and then you I, ended up and then you ended up doing Crazy Harry on Muppet Wizard of Oz years later. Yeah, when he didn't travel at the time, his health was not good. So they would have me do Crazy Harry. But uh, as far as an original voice, I guess the first one was probably uh, Laughing Boy in Dark City. And, and, and I did another character in that show. It was a little guy sweeping the floor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can't remember his name. He was a bartender. Okay. And I had a line with him. And then uh, the next would have been Art the Armadillo and Song of the Cloud Forest. Hmm. And yeah. Song of the Cloud Forest was, from what I've seen of like behind the scenes of it, uh, Dog City seemed to look like it was done like on a soundstage, like on an actual yeah. set. And yeah. Song of the Cloud Forest it seemed there was a lot of animation in that, like you would be doing mm -hmm. that in front of a blue screen. Did that yeah. feel? Did uh, did you feel like different doing those projects in different ways? Yeah, I think that was Dog City was really impressive. You know, Jim won an Emmy for that, directing that show. And that was shot in Canada, in Toronto. First time I've been up there. And it was a three-week shoot. It was shot in the same, <coughs> excuse me, it was shot in the same studio that Fraggle Rock was shot in. Oh, wow. So I found out the longer I was there, I realized that most of the crew had worked on Fraggle Rock. These were veterans that had worked with Jim before. And he liked it's my understanding that he liked to work with the same people that he liked working with. So it turns out the floor manager, the set designer, all of these were people that he had worked with before. The set itself was just crazy impressive. I mean, it was built up four feet off the floor because there were no humans in this show. But it was a, an entire city block. You could literally walk around the block. The, the, the storefronts, everything were miniaturized for the puppets. Um, cobblestone streets that they could take in and out, platforms they could take in and out. The interior of the bar was a complete room. I mean, you were physically inside the room when you shot it. Um, it was just incredible. They had a, an entire dock, like at a wharf, that was really cool. And, you know, we, we all performed multiple characters. I had Laughing Boy, 
and the little bartender guy for one or two shots. And then I would do background. I would do a little character sitting on the wharf fishing or uh, they had a bunch of uh, bloodhounds that were police and I would play one of those, you know, so, but that was the first time I really got to interact with Jim in a scene. He was playing Bugsy then. Mm-hmm. And I was working with Steve Whitmire, uh, Gordy Robinson, and Camille Benora, and Jim in these scenes. And I remember being overwhelmed. Obviously, it was exciting. But it was the first time I had been in a big scene. Most of the stuff I did at home was me and one other guy. And most of the time, we were just working in a very small space. This was a case where you would literally start the scene down the hall run over to the door, open the door, come through the door into Bugsy's office and have a whole scene. So everything working below the camera was like air traffic control. And you're skipping. You might have one monitor set up at the end of the hall, another one at the door, and then another one. Once. So all of this new layering of things that you had to consider. And Jim was just incredible. I mean, he's incredibly patient and generous, like everybody says. So that was wonderful, but but I'll never forget that first scene of being a little petrified. You know, my big thing was don't screw it up <laughs> because uh, it was just too good to be true. You know. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I've, I've always heard such wonderful Jim Henson stories from people who have worked with him, including you yeah. and including yeah. Marty Robinson, Chris Surf, uh, Mike Peterson. Do you know who Mike is? You know. I may have met him. It doesn't ring a bell. Was he was he a Canadian puppeteer or is he? Uh, yes, uh, he okay. was on Fraggle Rock. He's. Uh, I, I did a workshop with him a couple of years ago, and he was actually the first guest I had on this podcast because okay, of how close we are. Okay, that's good. It's it's possible. I know Gordy, and I know his name's actually Gordon. I think, but and then um, I know who you mean. The, let me think. The other fellow's name that was in Fraggle. His name will come to me as soon as I don't need to think about it. The, the other puppeteer, they were buds, and he, puppeteer that was inside um, Junior Gorg. Is, was is was it uh, Frank Meshkalite? No. There was another no, maybe, one. Maybe Actually, maybe he was a performer on one of the Waldos. Okay. The They'll other come one, back to me. He the other one the that, studio. The called, other one that uh, comes to mind is Rob Mills. Rob Mills, yes, that's it. Mm-hmm. And Rob, I worked with on uh dog city but he also w- would come in and fill in for people on dinosaurs later so uh-huh. uh, and he also was on ninja turtles i think he was on ninja turtles one yeah nice yeah so a few of the last projects that you did with jim henson before uh-huh. he passed away were uh muppet vision 3d and muppets at walt disney world and right. i i talked with alan troutman recently and kevin carlson yeah. kevin was one of the he, kevin was actually the second person who came on the oh, show cool. yeah. and they told me so many funny stories from behind the scenes at muppet vision 3d do you have any that you'd like to share well there was uh i, I think just personal stories that was my first time in la Mm -hmm. and a lot of the travel that I did I mean I had traveled some in the southeast but I hadn't really traveled a lot and until I started working I was 23 when I started so going to LA was like a big deal and we were staying at the Universal Hilton but the coolest thing to me was we were shooting on the Disney lot I said oh my gosh we're shooting on the Disney lot so my wife and I uh, my wife Judy went with me we didn't have any children at the time and, and she had the freedom, you know, to get off work and come with me. So we would, Henson was always very gracious. They would send us these first class tickets and I'm like, Lucky. Oh, they, would send, they would send me like first class tickets and say, can I, is it okay if I grade these down and get two tickets? It's whatever you want to do. <laughs> so I would grade them down and Judy would come with me. So anytime she wanted to go, we'd pull that little trick and she went with me. And I remember we got to uh, LA they were again crazy gracious we get to the airport and we were like had never been there and this guy picks us up and he says your car is out here and i figured it was like the town car so we go outside there's this limo sitting there and i walked literally walked past it he says hey 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 i said what he said this is your car i said what i'm like they're picking me up in a limo are you kidding me so judy and i just laughed thought that was funny and 
but they were just so generous, you know, I hear I am a new guy and they're treating me like this. And we get in the car and we go to or we stand at the Hilton. And I told you, we had a rental car. I said, you know, anytime I'm on a shoot, I like to kind of know where I'm going the next morning because the call was pretty early. I want to make sure I know how to get there. I said, let's drive over to Disney, which is nearby in Burbank to make sure I know how to get there. So she said, okay, we hop in the car. It's dark nighttime, North Hollywood, Burbank, and we're driving over to the studio. And I'm just like, in my childlike brain going, this is where Jungle Book was made. You know, I'm, I'm geeking out about it. And I said, they're shooting tonight. So I said, let's, let's see if we can get in. So we drive up to the security booth and a, the security guy comes out and he says, excuse me, you know, what's your name? And I told him and he looked me up and I'm on the list. So he said, sure, come in, just park over there and they're on stage, whatever. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yes. So we go in and it turns out, I don't remember the stage number, but the stage that we were shooting on was the same stage I found out later where they shot uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And nice. I thought that was cool. And also I could see the animation building, which at the time, I don't know what they were doing, but I just was fascinated. And we went in and I remember we go into the studio and I remember they were shooting with 3D cameras, which took a lot of light. I don't know why, but just a lot of light it was really warm in there. I remember walking up and Jim sees me and he says, oh, hi, Ricky, how are you? And says, hello to Judy. And he says, would you like to work? And I said, sure. And they were shooting the opening scene where, uh, you know, when you go in the movie and the first thing that happens is you see the 3D logo bouncing on the door and it comes out toward camera. Uh -huh. And then the door opens and it's Gonzo with a wood dowel uh, making the logo work. Well, Dave was doing Gonzo and he said, Dave could use a little help with Gonzo for this, doing the hands. So I'll go running into the set and Dave was like, I said, you know, Jim sent me in to help. He says, okay, you do this. Just take this and, and turn this and it just bounces to the music. You know, So <laughs> that was my first job <laughs> was making the logo telescope out and bounce. Mm. And uh, it was interesting on that shoot because they had um, on set, they would have this setup that would show you when you were in 3D. In other words, when your puppet or your prop crossed that line, it meant that it was in 3D space, you know, and so that was an interesting way to shoot. But that was my first experience. Then the next day, I go in and I'm sitting, I met all the LA puppeteers, which was incredible. It was the largest group of puppeteers I'd ever worked with. And I was primarily filling in whenever I was doing right hand work, I right handed uh, Beaker with. Uh, I shoot um, Richard Hunt and uh, right-handed Fozzie with Frank Eyes. And then whenever Frank was not doing Fozzie, I would do Fozzie in the background. Mm -hmm. And then whenever he was doing another character, if he was doing Piggy, I would do Sam the Eagle. And that's typical at Muppets to swap out in the case like that. And of course he would do all the main stuff, but I would just fill in and, 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 and one or two occasions, would have to do a line and I would go ask him, can I give you a read? Is this good? And he would listen and say yes or no or whatever. And which was petrifying <laughs> uh, because it was the first time I'd worked with Frank, but he was great. Everybody was great. And I remember that first day though, I'm sitting, we're all sitting, most of the local puppeteers were sitting in a corner of the studio and folding chairs and we're all chatting and I met Alan Troutman and Bruce Lenoil and uh, Kevin Carlson and um, uh, Terry Harden and just any, everybody I met. And Alan Troutman says, you know, did they fly you in? I said, yeah. He said, oh, that's great. He said, you know, you have a dressing room. I said, oh, no, I wouldn't have a dressing room. He said, no, you've got a dressing room. I know you do. He said, go upstairs. So I go upstairs. I thought, you got to be kidding me. So I go upstairs and uh it's neither here nor there. It's not important, but it was fascinating. I go upstairs. I've got my little bag and I see the, the hallway where all the dressing rooms are and there's my name on a door. I'm like, what? You've got to be kidding me. So I go in and there's this little pot of flowers and some cheese and crackers and wine with a big welcome from Disney. Welcome to the family. Cause this was the first thing Muppets did with Disney 
this the oh, deal had not been signed yet but it was supposed to happen obviously this is all before jim became ill and but i go into the room and i look down the hall and straight across from me that on the door is frank eyes and i'm like <laughs> yeah it's frank eyes so i'm geeking out and then i walk down the hall jim uh let's see steve was there the only person that wasn't on that shoot was jerry nelson and i don't really know why um uh, but everybody else was there i had worked with steve before but steve was doing waldo you know the the 3d character yep and was when, also I, when i saw muppet vision i got a little waldo toy oh okay which is, yeah in, which is in this room i should have dug it out but okay. uh man of course he was doing bean bunny so uh anyways i uh i uh spent days we were there for maybe two weeks and it was just a blast and there were other things that happened it was a very exciting time at henson because they were it was the new deal with disney they were, they had plans to do uh puppet shows in la which is they were bringing in the la puppeteers they also were bringing in some new performers myself included to uh, my understanding was they were going to do a studio in florida uh at the disney at the time it was disney mgm and they were going to uh, basically have a henson studio down there oh, that nice. you know that was just going to be a production studio and you could go through obviously and do the tour and look in just like you know the animation studio they had down there too at the time uh they did lilo and stitch and brother bear down there oh and, nice yeah so with that was happening too while we were working and so while I was working on Muppets, uh, Muppet Vision 3D, oh, well, I'll tell you this story though first, well, just before I forget, you were talking about funny stories. I was, for the first time I had assisted Richard Hunt and Richard had a reputation for just being funny and, and reading the newspaper a lot and going up at the last minute right before the shot. So literally I'm sitting there, there was a scene where Beaker is in the 3D lab helping Bunsen and there was this gag where he's pulling levers and there's this big wheel that's turning. It looks like almost like a water wheel and he gets caught in it and it pulls him up onto the wheel. And that was a dummy beaker that they strapped on with Velcro, <laughs> but I'm helping Richard and he had to do all this, you know, and he's doing all this stuff and then falls down. And then the dummy beaker goes around and Richard would just off stage go, whoop, 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 you know, do his thing. So I'm sitting there with Richard, Richard, exactly, reading a newspaper. We both have hard hats on because they're afraid that Will's gonna hit us in the head. I'm like 23 years old. We're sitting there and he says, here, you hold him. He hands me Beaker. I've got both of my hands in Beaker's hands and he's just doing the head. And so he's reading the newspaper and I have a pretty heavy accent, uh, particularly back then I did for the Southern accent. So Richard says, well, you sound like you have an accent. He said, where are you from? And I'm like, well, I'm from, from Georgia. Well, I can hear it now. Your folks are going to go to the movie and say, I can see my son. That's his head right there on the TV. <laughs> He's making fun of my accent. <laughs> and I felt like I had been accepted, you know, into the tribe because he was making fun. I thought, oh, that's great. And uh, so he was a blast. We did the shot and sure enough, they're, they're counting down, uh, uh, Richard, we're ready in five, four, three, two, one, boom. He's right up there like he had done it a thousand times. Um, and then I had other, you know, other bits that happened, just working with Frank Eyes, assisting was fun. The stuff they do backstage and say to each other is very funny. Some of it you can repeat, some of it you can't, but it's hilarious. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, I had an audition, one of the producers, Jim's assistant at the time, um, uh, now her name's going to escape me. See, I'm getting old. It'll come to me. His assistant, who was with him, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, most of the time, uh, she said, oh, they want to audition you for a show uh, that's coming up, and Richard Hunt's going to do the audition. I said, okay. So, um, he comes up and says, Ricky, grab a puppet, just any of those puppets off the stand. And he grabs a puppet. And he says, follow me. And we go behind, we go behind a uh, uh, flat 
and there's nobody back there except me and Richard Hunt and these two puppets. And he says, go up. So we both go up and he just says, look left, look right, look over there. We don't even have a camera. He's just watching the puppet. And uh, he, uh, I don't want to say, how f family safe is your show? I, I, I have a bleeper, don't worry. Okay, I don't want to do anything offensive. Uh, but he said, uh, his puppet leans over and says, hey, you want to have some of me? Oh my God. <laughs> and, and I just like, I just absolutely, I thought, what do I do? And I paused, uh, I had the puppet pause and, I, and my puppet says, uh, no, but my mother will, will do anybody. Oh my God. <laughs> and he says, you'll be fine. <laughs> so that was the end of it he said you'll be fine <laughs> oh man so it was a very bizarre audition but it was typical of it sounded what most of the again i didn't know him very well but it was very funny and he i think was just trying to see what it would do if he threw me a curveball and but uh so then later jim's assistant comes up and says okay you're going to be in the show you're going to be one of the main guys that show never happened. It was one of the things that went away. I don't even know what it was, frankly. I was, I was sort of like, I would just say, okay, whatever's next. You know, I just didn't want to screw it up. Mm. I was wondering uh, if you remembered uh, what the show was, or, or maybe I don't. Was there was a show at one time called Muppet High. It might have been that, but okay. I typically, I typically was so excited to just get the work that I didn't ask a lot of questions. I'm, I tend to be when I first meet somebody in particular, you know, Jim and others, I don't say a whole lot. So it was puppets are more of a way of me coming out of my shell and, and I'll talk about it all day long, but, I, but in person, I tended to be, and still I'm rather quiet. Uh, uh, I don't know that shy is the right word, but just quiet. And uh, so I would not, I remember when Jim asked me to work on Ninja Turtles, he said, uh, have you ever heard of Ninja Turtles? I said, well, my, my brother watches the cartoon. He said, well, you know what they are? I said, not really. He said, well, they're, they're these uh, turtles that do Kung Fu. <laughs> and he said, uh, you're going to work on the movie. I said, great. I didn't ask him what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't say when. I just said, okay. <laughs> mm. And that's the way things would happen is I would just get word of mouth. I would be called. Uh, rarely auditioned. It, it was usually a, a phone call, and I'm not saying that to be big-headed. It's just the way that it was done, that mm -hmm. he would sort of have in mind, I think, who he wanted to do a certain thing, and I was a new guy, and he would, the great thing about Jim at the time is here I was, someone with very little experience, but uh, he believed in, and he, they, this has been said a lot about him, that he he would often have more confidence in you than you would. I mean, he, he might see your potential more than you would. And he would throw you in the mix. He would absolutely wow. take a risk. And that's something that's very rare. Most people, and I think in my, my little time in the business, don't like to take chances if they think somebody's going to embarrass them. But Jim would just throw you in it, you know, sink or swim. And that, I really appreciated that mm. about his way of doing things. Amazing. Very encouraging. Mm. Alan Troutman told me a funny little story from the set of Muppet Vision 3D. Uh, maybe you know of it, but um, he had a suggestion that he uh, that he gave to Steve Whitmire, which is that one of the soldiers in the finale should react to the cannon. Uh -huh. And Steve went up to Jim and said, hey, Jim, Alan just had this really good idea. Maybe we can have one of the soldiers react. And Jim's like, oh, that's a great idea. Steve, I'm putting you on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And then you did uh, Muppets at Walt Disney World. What was uh, that like to get to shoot at Walt Disney World? Uh, that was that was like the coolest vacation in the world. That mm. was again. Judy and I went down. There was a place at the time. It's not there anymore. I think if you go to Orlando now, there is called Downtown Disney or something. But there used to be a bunch of apartments, sort of an apartment complex, that were sort of. Uh, they weren't cabins, but they were bungalows and really nice that guests of the park would stay in. And they put us up in those. And I think we were there for two weeks. And it was like every day you get up in the morning and you go to end of the park for free and put on a Muppet and do Muppet stuff. It was ridiculous. Nice. And some of it was shot in studio. Um, I remember at the time we were shooting, 
I think the Mickey Mouse Club, the new Mickey Mouse Club was shooting. So with all these young kids running around, it turns out they were like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera and yes. all of these. They were all there and nobody knew who they were, but they were all shooting there too. And the first thing I did was I played, there's a whole bit at the beginning of the special where there are, you see the Muppets feet like trudging, trudging through a swamp. And oh. I was one of the legs. I don't remember which one I did. Okay. But I was one of those. They were just rotted, you know, feet. A really funny gag. And they go to Kermit's uh, family's swamp. And I played Grandpa Frog. And he only had a line or two. And he, he sang in the song. But again, Jim would just throw me in there, I, you know, and say, here, you're going to do this. And I would also fill in most of that show I filled in. So, cause it was most of the classic characters and all the key performers were there. So Frank was performing piggy and Fozzie and Jim was doing all his characters, but I would fill in and do Fozzie for a few scenes. I did, um, let me think I did Camilla for a few scenes in front of the Chinese theater where they're singing. Oh, cool. I, I did, um, let me think. Fozzie's mother. I did her in a couple of background shots. Uh, but, but, but I got to do, there was a, a shot of Sprocket with a bunch of dogs and a dog kennel that were staying at a dog kennel at Disney World. I got to do <laughs> Sprocket for that. Uh, let me think. It was a little bit of everything. But one nice. of the nicest things about that shoot, we would shoot during the day. And then at night, Steve Whitmire had a, talent for getting us in to Epcot at night to go eat at a nice restaurant. So <laughs> I remember we would go into Epcot Center and then go to the Mexican Pavilion or another pavilion and have dinner together. That was fun. But the most memorable thing to me was how Jim interacted with fans because there was a lot of setup time. You know, you're literally in the park. I mean, it's full functioning park and they would just rope off the area you were shooting in. And people would come up and take pictures and want to talk to Jim. And remember, he was wearing, you've seen the pictures of him, a, a big straw hat, a flowery a Floridian, like a sort of Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses. And he had Kermit on his hand. So, I mean, it just, and he would walk under the rope. And remember this conversation he had. I'm sitting there watching this, pinching myself, going, I cannot believe I'm sitting here. And there's this couple with their two twin girls. And they're like telling him how wonderful his work is and how much they admire him. And he kneels down with Kermit to the two girls and he wants to know what they do. And it turns out they were, I can't remember where they were from, but they, they were in those competitions where you get on a log. Maybe you do this in Canada where you're log rollers, where you're on top of a log running. I'm sure there's stuff like I that. I don't know Canada, what that's called. Never seen it it sounds like a Canadian sport, but... <laughs> That's what they did. And Jim was fascinated. Oh, you do, you're a lot rock, rock roller. You know? But I thought here's Jim Henson showing so much. He's so gracious to his family and really enjoying himself. And I, I thought, you know, for him at, with his original goal of having the characters end up in the Disney park, that must've been a really special time to be in the park, seeing people, in, in real time, enjoying the Muppets and interacting was really cool. Uh, the other thing that was fun, we did, uh, oh, I got to fill in for Steve on Lips and Electric Mayhem, which was cool. Oh, wow. Jim was, uh, I think Steve would often do the keyboard for Dr. Teeth because Steve knows the keyboard. Mm -hmm. so he was assisting Jim and, and they asked me to do lips so that was fun so you know as a puppeteer growing up with the Muppets you sort of have an out-of-body experience when you put these characters on and go wow I used to watch you on television <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what and, it's like for me sometimes when I'm doing these shows <laughs> well the puppets too one interesting thing about the Muppet puppets uh, at Sesame and at Muppets they all have a tag on the bottom that tells when they were made and or if they're a refurbished character they'll have that on there and they'll have a date so you could look at the puppet and tell if you were working with one of the originals from the muppet show or whether it had just been redone oh i got to tell you this story 
Uh, okay. The opening of the show was shot in the Grand Floridian. And uh, the head of Disney at the time was Michael Eisner. And so, of course, there are people coming in. I mean, guests are there. And they roped off this area. They have this big dining room table right in a restaurant. And Michael Eisner sitting there at the opening of the show with Fozzie Bear and his Fozzie's mother. And I remember the line. Uh, Fozzie's mother says to Fozzie, th they're putting butter on their bread. Says, <laughs> she says, would you like some honey with that butter? No, would you like some butter with that honey? <laughs> and he says, no, mom, I'm sorry, whatever. It was this silly line. And Michael Eisner sitting between them. And the camera widens out and all the other Muppets come in and basically fill the screen. And then when they pull back, Michael Eisner's clothes are ripped. He's got a smudge on his face. And that was the whole gag. So he had these rip off clothes. And right before they gave me, they gave us all a puppet and they gave me Uncle Deadly. Oh, I'm a huge. Nice. Now, this is before, you know, Uncle Deadly's had a life of his own now. Mm -hmm. And Matt's doing an incredible job with him. But th before then, he was just basically a wonderful, creepy character that sort of you didn't know much about. But he was a beautiful puppet mm. uh, from the original show. This was the original Uncle Deadly puppet. You know, when the puppets get old, they start to dry out and they begin to deteriorate. So you have to be really careful with them. And I remember putting my hand in there and just going, oh, my gosh, this is the same puppet that Jerry used on the Muppet Show. This is crazy. And, and I believe Jerry was on that shoot. Yeah, he was there. He was doing Fozzie's mom and Robin. So that particular shot was just a group shot. So and he didn't say anything. But my job, we all had to rip a piece of clothing off. But they wanted me to take Uncle Deadly because he had live hands. And they put makeup on a makeup uh, sponge. And they wanted me to hit him in the face or graze him to get makeup on his face when we're all up there i thought oh my oh. gosh i have to hit michael eisner in the face <laughs> poor and michael eisner not... yes so i remember they pulled us all aside and said one note do not touch his hair he doesn't have a lot of hair but he wears a toupee <laughs> they said don't pull his hair off and i'm the one closest to the hair and i'm like oh my gosh well when you do stuff with a puppet looking up at when you're doing that sort of thing you can't use a monitor you have to look up to see where you're hitting you just never hit it so if you look back at the opening of the, i've looked at it you go through and look back i am literally unfortunately the puppets part a little and you can see the side of my head because i'm reaching up like this and looking up instead of at the monitor so i could smack him in the face <laughs> ouch luckily i didn't luckily i didn't uh knock his toupee off but that was a fun a fun thing but that that shoot was just a blast and we we were living in georgia we didn't even fly down we drove down uh there's another story that's funny i was a day late i looked at the calendar wrong oh and i was a day late which is not good to do but i found out that because i was a day late they had planned because i was the new guy they needed a scene with Miss Piggy and the teacup ride. And nobody wanted to do it because it made <laughs> you sick. They were going to make me do it. <laughs> Did you but get because sick? I, because I was a day late, I missed it. Oh, so I think lucky. Steve Whit, I think Steve Whitmire maybe had to do it. I don't uh, think Frank wanted to do it. I'll have to so, message Steve and ask him if he got I'm, sick I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he had to do it. But I was that was going to be baptism by fire, and it never happened. Mm. Well, with what you were saying about uh, Steve being able to mimic the piano playing, I, I told Paul Rudolph a little story that you had told me from something I saw on a behind the scenes video for Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Paul brought up uh, the song Me Am What Me Am, which Cookie Monster had sung. And I remember oh, yeah. seeing behind the scenes, Tyler Bunch was doing a piano player. You oh, were yeah. doing you were doing the hands. And I remember asking you, how do you do it? Because Tyler said you can't even play piano. Yeah. And you would. And you had said, Paul Rudolph helped me, and I faked the rest. And so I told yes. Paul that, and he says thank you for that little shout yes. out. <laughs> he, I remember they told me I was going to be assisting, and they had the, usually they have the track, you know, that you can listen to. 
usually if it's a big music thing, you know, uh, usually have it in advance. I just, for whatever reason, it was just right before we went on. And so we went in and Paul and uh, Tyler and I just listened to it. And, you know, I don't know the keyboard, but I can fake it uh, too. if I kind of know. So that's the way it worked, but it, it was fine. It worked. And, and they're not on me the whole time. I had what like, the very opening shot was a tight. So as long as I got the first few riffs close, then the camera moved off of me. So mm. it's too bad good. they didn't end up using that piano player character. I don't know if you saw the final episode, but it was just Cookie Monster singing by himself. Oh, really? Because uh, wasn't he like Liberace kind of all in a sequiny outfit or something it seems like i, I can't remember the, the you character. mean the piano player guy the piano player yeah looking back yes he, he did had a very like liberace like that. look yeah mm. so you also were on uh, dinosaurs which for any of you, you listeners who are not aware now streaming on disney plus go watch it i actually started watching it the day that it launched like the first thing yeah. i did in the morning my mom's getting ready for work and she sees baby Sinclair yeah. whacking Earl with a frying pan. Not the mama, not the mama. And my mom's like, what on earth is this? And I said, oh, it's, it's a TV show called Dinosaurs. And my mom never watched it. And she keeps seeing all the slapstick material on it. She's like, this is a show that people watched. Yeah, they did. She was amazed because she thought it was, it was hard kinda, to believe. Yeah, she thought it was kind of dumb, I will say. That but was 1991 or something. Like, yep. How anyway. old were you? You had to be pretty young. Were you I wasn't then? even. I wasn't even. I was, I was born in 1990. Say, I was born in I, 1999. <laughs> that's what I thought. No, you were definitely watching reruns. No, I just. <laughs> I, I was watching it on puppeteer. Disney Plus. I just worked with a puppeteer named Emily Marsh, and she's not even 30 yet. We were all in the green room talking about dinosaurs. I said, "How? When were you born?" She's 1990. I said, "Oh my gosh, you were like three. <laughs> No. Yeah, dinosaurs was a little bit before my time for me yeah. the, for me that would have been um i was born about a year before the disney film dinosaur came out the yeah. animated oh, yeah, one yeah, yeah. Or, i remember that yeah yeah and in dinosaurs i almost said dinosaur dinosaurs mm -hmm. <laughs> you puppeteered uh, grandma ethel and yeah um, the last two seasons yeah yeah did you get to know florence stanley that well you know i'm trying to remember i met her <clears throat> By the time I came along on Dinosaurs, you know, the show was on for four years and I didn't come on the show until season three. And I was, it sort of happened, Dinosaurs started right after Ninja, uh, Ninja Turtles 2. Mm -hmm. It was the next big job for the Creature Shop. And there was some talk of possibly me working on it, but it was not a done deal. And honestly, by that time, uh, unfortunately, Jim had passed away. This was one of the first uh, big jobs with Disney uh, as the new deal. Well, I think the deal had fallen through at that point, but they were still working together. And um, it just didn't work out for me to get to go do it. They were using mostly local puppeteers. If you went out there to work, they would fly a few key people out, but a lot were local and were wonderful puppeteers out there. So they didn't have to really fly any but me in for that. But by the time the third season came along, I actually got a call to work on Ninja Turtles 3. And I said, well, let me check. And it turns out Henson was not doing Ninja Turtles 3. And I did, I don't know why, but I called, would often talk to Kevin, my buddy Kevin Clash and others at the, the company. I said, look, um, is there anything, or I would call the Henson office occasionally and just say, is there anything coming up if I was trying to plan? Because I really didn't work for many other people other than Henson as a puppeteer. I would, was still living in Georgia, still had a job there uh, doing artwork, uh, design work, and working at a local TV station. So Kevin said, you know what? He said, they're looking, they, they really need somebody to do grandma because right now we're just, when she's on the show, just somebody jumps in there that's available. There's nobody regular doing it. Oh. And at the time, he said, because Kevin would do it, sometimes I think Brian Henson would do it, then other times uh, Dave Greenaway would do it. And so he said also they were shooting Sesame Street at the same time the season shot simultaneously, uh, Sesame and Dinosaurs. And Kevin was having trouble doing both. 
So he said, look, I'm, I really need somebody to fill. They would have people fill in for him. He might be gone for a week to go to New York. And so he said, you know, I would like to consider having you do that. So, so he said, let me check on it. So he talked to them and, um, you know, doing the, the, I was not as versed in the animatronic characters. I assisted Splinter on Ninja Turtles, but as far as actually working an animatronic character, I hadn't done that. So they were a little hesitant, but they finally, they said, no, okay, he's in. So they flew me out and uh, on season three, and I started doing grandma and I would mimic her. I listened to as much of Florence as I could, but I didn't get to meet her until they would have cast parties on occasion, like pressers. Mm -hmm. And I met her at one of those and she's a sweetheart of a lady. She's passed away, but, uh, but she was incredible. But I do know that if I ever hear her in a movie, she, she was a character actress and Every now and then I'll be in the den passing through and a movie will come on. I'll, I'll hear that voice. <laughs> say, That's Florence. Uh, and uh, cause I just recognize her. Mm. <clears throat> so I would just mimic her and then she would come in and on that show, primarily the puppeteers would do the voice with the voice artist in mind and their inflections and their, their way of approaching things. And then later, except for Kevin, obviously he did the baby, but, uh, then she would come back and do it later. And I, I did a few other characters, hand puppet characters, and uh, Pearl Sinclair, which is Earl's sister. I did her, which is animatronic, and Gus, which was a unisaur for a couple of episodes. So I got to do, and a lot of fill-in work. You know, I, I was the new guy, so Ethel wasn't always in an episode, and I would fill in for the baby on, and they would try to deliberately do episodes that were baby light you know, when Kevin was not there, just because it's such a, a big character, you know, mm. yeah. but, but that was a lot of pressure, a lot of fun, but it, it, you know, it was like, you just really wanted to get it right, you know, so it was, it could be stressful, but a great job. Mm. I got to ask you, a couple of weeks ago, we lost Jessica Walter, who of course was the yeah. voice of Fran, uh, while another past guest, Alan Troutman, was doing the, yes. uh, the face. Did, right. you, did you get to know Jessica that well? I did not. I, I actually, unfortunately, I honestly, I didn't know her work that much at the time. Oh. But unfortunately, now that she's passed, I was looking at her resume and I thought, oh my goodness. All this stuff she's done is pretty incredible. That's what I thought. So too. it was sad. You know, I wish I'd been, I, I think I probably, again, when I'm at these parties, I, I wanted to say hello to Florence. I didn't spend a lot of time meeting everybody, but most of them would be at these press events. I do rem remember Sherman, Hen is it Sherman Hensley that was, uh, as shoot, the, uh, he was, uh, Mr. The Mr. Ridgefield, yes. Mr. Ridgefield. Yes. I, he would come to the set occasionally. One, one thing that happened on set that was pretty funny is we shot at CBS MTM and the, sh the other shows that were on the lot at the time were Roseanne, uh, a show called Evening Shade, which was uh, Burt Reynolds and a bunch of other big actors. And the big show was Seinfeld. Oh, nice. So Seinfeld, you'd see those folks all the time. Uh, Jerry driving in and his... Uh, fancy cars and uh the other show that shot right next to us was the gary shanling show oh, cool. and that was gary shanling and um uh, uh jeffrey tambour and occasionally you'd be standing there working standing at the animus the stands with the waldos and all that stuff and turn around and gary shanling would be standing over the shoulder <laughs> he was fascinated with watching everything one of my favorite memories too, other than the puppeteering, is one day, I'm a huge fan of Rick Baker, uh, you know, the makeup artist, uh, mm -hmm. who, who is famous for uh, a lot of, you know, uh, American Werewolf in London and um, uh, tons of other movies. So one day, and of course the people in the creature shop think he's like a god, you know, his sculpting and mask making ability. And I'm standing there working one day with Alan, next to Alan Troutman. And he said, Ricky, he said, look over your shoulder. And I turn around and Rick Baker is standing right there <laughs> with his, one of his kids on his shoulder and his wife. And he's asking me what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. 
So, oh, I think I was just helping. Occasionally, I would do the hands on Roy, you know, his little, the little done at T-Rex hands. Oh, yeah. With remote control. Or I would help somebody with their eyes or something as an assistant. But that kind of thing would happen where some somebody that I never thought I'd meet in my life would be standing there because they were just fascinated. But, but that it was just such a, a, a great show and such a great group of people to work with. And I learned a lot on the show. I mean, not only about puppeteering, but I got to pitch show ideas. I would come up with that. When, when I was not, there was a lot of dead time on the set. And when I first started working on movies and on this show, I was just like, can I clean the floor or help with craft services? <laughs> You're paying me way too much, <laughs> you know? So I started writing and I would, I would draw and do storyboards and write. So I pitched them the idea for uh, driving Miss Ethel, which they actually did. I oh. didn't get to write it because I was not in the writer's guild. Mm -hmm. And I pitched them. I got to go to the writing room and pitch them. Uh, I had an idea called uh, uh, the lizard of Oz, which was a spoof of the wizard of Oz. And all the characters were going to play the characters. It was a two episode idea. And Grandma Ethel was going to be the Wicked Witch. And, uh, and uh, they loved the idea, but couldn't convince CBS. I'm sorry, ABC. Who was it? I don't remember now. Yeah, it was on ABC. A ABC. Um, they couldn't convince them to, to spend the money it would have taken to do it. because. But, but the writers loved it. And the head writer loved it. And he actually pitched it. So I was like, wow. And, you know, it was just learning getting to learn the process. And one of the finest things was to do read throughs every Monday you would read through the, at lunch, you would go to the big conference room, screening room that have a buffet brought in and everybody sits around a big table and reads the next week's script and, you know, to get response in the room and see what they need to tweak. That was a lot of fun. And by the end of the week, because of SAG reg regulations, you would start working on a Monday about seven. And then by the end of the week, if, if you came in later, you had to have a 12 hour turnaround. So by the end of the week, you were coming in at noon and leaving at two in the morning. So Ooh. Friday nights, we would miss the show because it was on the air. So what they would do is at dinner, they would bring in that week's episode and air it for us personally while we had dinner. That was a lot of fun. And but the terrible thing is most puppeteers, the first time they watch their performance, you're just going, oh, I looked left when I should have looked right. <laughs> you're so critical of all the mechanics that you don't enjoy it as much as you would the second viewing. And that's something that Frank Oz has always said, that when you're looking at a monitor, you're basically yeah. thinking backwards. Yes. And yeah. spe speaking of Frank Oz, uh, you were talking quite a bit about working with him. Uh, you had told me before that when you did Muppets from Space, he was doing Bowfinger at the time. Have you ever seen Bowfinger? Yes, I love that movie. It's a great yeah. film. I remember I had just finished up a meeting at school, and my school and SCC is near a thrift store. So I was like, you know what? I got time to kill. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna go to the shops. Yeah. And there was a v there was a VHS tape of Bowfinger, and I called up my friend because we were gonna be working on a project when I got back, and I was like. I got something cool to show you when I get back. Oh, and yes. I, I, I brought it to where, to where we were, which was a little lab. And I said, this was directed by one of my heroes. And so oh, yeah. I told her that story that you had told me about um, performing Animal. So you did Animal on set. Was that Frank yeah. Oz's idea? The, I don't know, honestly, how they make the decisions. I think they probably run it by them. I, I know there have been occasions where for example, most of the performers at the time, if they could choose who they wanted, that would be the, the best route to go. Uh, it, it's very flattering to be asked to do that. But at the same time, I remember the first time I'd not performed Animal to fill in. And again, it's, it's just filling in. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful puppet, or a great character, but, and I love Animal. But the first time I worked with Frank actually filling in, we were, when we were in LA, there was this TV special called the, um, let me think, it was, it was the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, it was like a uh, retrospective show about Ed Sullivan. Oh, cool. Because, you know, Muppets used to be on Ed Sullivan quite a bit in the early days. Right. Of course, Ed Sullivan's long gone, but they had, um, uh, what's his name? Um, ah, shoot, there I go again. Uh, 
there was a, a, a huge comedian whose name is escaping me. He's on The Big Bang Theory, playing an oh. old guy. What is his uh, name? Bob Newhart. Yes, thank you, Bob Newhart. I'm I'm a huge Big Bang oh, Theory oh, fan. Me, I've, yes. I've been watching it a lot lately. Uh, me too, and I'm a big Bob Newhart fan too. So I don't know why I couldn't remember, but <laughs> he was hosting the show. Now this, of course, was uh, let me think. This would have been after Jim's passing. So I do remember we were, let me think. They had just finished shooting um, or the show was about to premiere a uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh. And nice. so they were going as a promotional. They were going to sing one of the famous songs from the, uh, it's just one more sleep till Christmas. Is that the song? Yep. One of okay. the most loved yes. the Steve Whitmire's performance. Exactly. It was incredible. So they were doing that scene, recreating a big scene around a dinner table on stage at this theater for the special. And uh, so we were getting ready to do it. And Frank was doing Piggy. So they said, who do you want to do Fozzie? And he said, I'd, I'd like Ricky to do it. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So nice. all, but what I had to do, the interesting part of that story that fascinated me, I had to, it was all to track because it was a song, so I didn't have to say anything, but Fozzie did have a line, so I had to hit it. And he had to travel. He had to come out from behind the, the, the wings, walk with another group of puppets over to the table and sort of take his place at the table at, while singing. And I remember Frank was doing Piggy, and the thing that fascinated me is I'm walking in during the take, and when I get to the end of my move, the puppet Fozzie's head's a little behind somebody. Frank is full tilt performing Piggy, and I feel this hand on my back <laughs> grab me, and it's Frank's loot free hand. He's not only puppeteering Piggy, he takes my back and pulls me into the shot and shoves me in so that Fozzie can be seen. So I'm like, not only is he puppeteering Piggy, he's puppeteering me, who's puppeteering Fozzie. <laughs> Just funny. the ability to, to, to do all of those things at the same time is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. Every time I see an animal shirt anywhere, I go up to the person that's wearing the shirt and I say, hey, I, I like your shirt. And uh, it's interesting because I, I have a friend who uh, performed animal on set of Muppets from Space while his yeah. regular performer was out. Yeah. Some of them have no idea of what that means. And no. I feel like the thumbnail for this video of animals on the thumbnail amongst many characters that you've done. <laughs> I'm just going to clarify. Ricky never did like animal in any productions. He just was a temporary no, fill in exactly. on and set. I, yeah, and I think most of the puppeteers want to make that clear. These characters are like, so close to the performers hearts and souls that we don't claim at all you know it's a great honor to be asked to do it and you want to do a good job you know but on on the particular case of animal they did tell me beforehand that was shot in wilmington north carolina right and they called and just said look you know uh, we'd like you to to do animal for the shoot frank will be in on certain days so he would come in for shots that involve guest stars for the most part. In other words, Piggy had a few scenes with guest stars. And so he would come in and spend a day or two on set and do all of his shots. And then he would go, I think he was editing, maybe editing the movie or something. But so uh, I remember just for that movie, I filled in for Animal. Of course, he came back and looped it later. And then I think for part of the film, uh, Peter Lenz at the time, this is before Eric Jacobson had taken was doing Piggy. So I think Peter Lenz did Piggy for a few shots. And, and then of course, Steve by then was doing Kermit and, uh, and he also did Piggy for a few shots. Hmm. So we sort of, you would try to stick with the character as much as you could once you were getting the hang at it. But, uh, but animals, incredible puppet. He's light as a feather. It is his butter like mechanism that makes his eyes go up and, and you barely move him and his little ostrich feathers, you know, it's just a beautiful puppet. I love him. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny that uh, Peter was doing another one of Frank's characters. I, I, yeah. Peter Peter and I are very close friends, and he actually yes. puts it best when he says, Frank looped over his awful, scratchy voice. <laughs> yes. And uh, John Kennedy was doing yes. Fozzie. And right. what's so funny about that is that Peter, John, Drew Massey, and you, and I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm going to say, the four of you had a little cameo in Muppets from Space. Oh, geez. Yes. 
Uh, that was something that I was reluctant to do because I don't like being on camera. But the weird thing is they, I had one line and it got cut because I did such a bad job. What was the line? I, I don't remember. It was something really, it was like something crazy, like, oh man, it was just something <laughs> stupid. But I remember what was weird about it is they said, we want you guys to do a cameo. And I thought, well, it's Muppet tradition to do cameo. So I thought that's an honor. But then I find out we have to be in full makeup. <clears throat> so they made me up like Boy George, put me in a gold <laughs> jumpsuit and put a colander on my head. Um, I mean, literally half my face was white, half was black. It was the biz most bizarre thing. <laughs> it was fun, but I don't want to do that again. Mm. Now, do you actually have a cast and crew jacket from Muppets from Space that was given? I heard that those you were given know, out. I'm trying to remember... I do have, I have, they had these uh, sort of sweatshirt kind of hoodie things that have gonzo on them. There were more than one thing. I've got one of them. I don't know that I have all of them. I've had most shows I have those from. I've got the dinosaurs one. I've got one of the early Jim Henson production jackets. I've, somehow I missed the Ninja Turtle one. I don't know. Mm. I must have been out that day and didn't order it. I still kick myself for that. Mm. <laughs> wow. So another time when I went down to the shops near my school, uh, yeah. same place, Value Village, and um, I saw a book, a big bag book, actually. Uh, really? I think it was oh, called wow. Shelley's Big Adventure. I didn't buy it, but mm -hmm. I did look through it, and I remember talking to you about Big Bag a few times. And after you had recommended it to me, I checked it out. It's great. I really like it. Wow, that's cool. I didn't see much of the merchandise. I, that show was a lot of fun, though, because it was shot in Florida at Disney. I was just wondering where it yeah. was shot. I thought it, I, I thought maybe because it was from uh, Sesame Street, the company that does Sesame Street, it might have been done in New York. Well, the, the thing was, the producer on that show was Nina Bamberger, uh, Nina Elias Bamberger. And uh, God rest her soul, she, she passed away several right. years ago with cancer and just a sweetheart of a producer from Sesame. Mm -hmm. And she was a huge fan of mine and so encouraging. And she would work for Sesame. I think her husband worked at Nickelodeon and Nickelodeon had a presence in Orlando. So they lived in Orlando. Right. So she would try to get productions down there in Orlando when she could, it was closer to home for her. It was just fun to work down there. And so Big Bag was shot entirely at Disney MGM. And uh, I remember the fun thing about that for me was Bag, originally the Bag character, I did Bag and I did a, a sock puppet named uh, Argyle. Right. And <clears throat> originally the script for Bag was just, it would say Bag hawks or tweets, but this is what he means or she means. And then it, uh, it, it would say, uh, sound effect. So the original plan was to have some sort of sound effect. And I was like, oh, geez, I don't do a sound. Effect. So I came up with a bag language and I, I tried it and the read through and they loved it. So they let me do it. So I just put B in front of everything instead of hello is blah, blah, or how are you? Blah, blah, you know, or uh, where are we going? Blah, blah, blowing. Hmm? You know, so I did it and I, I said, yes, let's do that. So that was a, a lot of fun. Mm. And Argyle was uh, Scottish, so that was fun. He just sounded like this. And mm -hmm. and Joey Mazzarino was playing Chelly, and he played another sock named Jim Sock. So he was New York Bronx from the Brooklyn, you know, typical Joey voice. Yeah, because I, I think, I think Joey's from New York originally. Oh, yes, he's from uh, Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know he was from Brooklyn. I knew he was from New yeah. York City. But... No, he, he, he moved into the city, but I think he, he grew up in Brooklyn. Mm. Yeah, Big Bag. It's very much similar to Sesame Street. A lot of animated pieces here yeah. and there. Some of them done by some uh, people who have done voices for Sesame Street and animation for yeah. Sesame Street, including somebody that I'm very close with who was a guest on this show, Ivy oh. Austin. Do you know her? Oh, no. She was a, gu oh, a guest on your show. Uh, I don't know. She did oh, a lot she of an animator. She's a voice artist who did a lot of vocals on Sesame Street. Like, um, oh, okay. was one of my particular favorites is uh, five waltzing chairs dance all in a line. One, two, okay. three, four, five. Okay. And um, she was, uh, did you get to know Danny Epstein very well? 
that name is really familiar. He was uh, Sesame Street. Me. He was Sesame Street's musical director and also Ivy's dad. Oh, Danny Epstein. I'm trying to remember. See, I was not. I was only on Sesame for two seasons, and I've done a lot of animation for the show. What was it? Was he in music? You say? Yeah, music uh, coordinator. Okay, I think I might have worked with him uh, sometimes at Magnetic when we would do animations that had songs. Mm. I would do like lyrics and then work with someone of that name. I may have very well worked with him in that department because we would send up lyrics and have someone there do the music for it. So I think maybe this, the name sounds really familiar. Mm. Every time I ask someone, because Ivy and I have be, have remained very close friends since she's uh -huh. been on this show. Every time I ask someone at Sesame street, do you know Ivy Austin? The answer I usually get is yeah, that's Danny Epstein's daughter. So I yeah, guess he yeah, was pretty yeah. well known around there. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, you also performed in Muppets Wizard of Oz where you did not just Crazy Harry like we were talking about earlier, but you also did Scooter. And by that mm -hmm. time, Richard Hunt's character, Scooter, uh -huh. for anyone who doesn't know, Scooter was originally Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, Sco uh, Richard Hunt's characters and Jerry Nelson's characters didn't yet have a consistent performer. Right. Was, was there ever talk about you doing Scooter full time? You know, the, the way... It's a long story, but the, the whole recasting of characters is a, a, a pretty long uh, discussion. But the, in that particular case, we were auditioned, I say we, that it was a audition that was held by Disney and Henson mm -hmm. for uh, the way they did it is they would, it was sort of by an invitation. It wasn't a cattle call to everybody they were primarily working with people they knew so they sent in my case i got a list of characters that they would like me to read for and i read for those uh, literally in video audio tape and sent that back to new york and then they came back after that initial audio audition and said okay now we're going to narrow it down to these we want you to come to new york put the puppet on and do an audition here so they had like two days of auditions in New York and two days of auditions in LA. And so I went up and I think I auditioned, I think it was Robin, uh, Waldorf, Statler, no, Statler, Swedish Chef. You know, a lot of us read for a lot of characters. And I read for Scooter and they didn't tell us anything. I mean, that, I mean, zero, uh, just thank you. And, have a nice day. So we all went home. And then time went on and I eventually got a call from Martin Baker, who was a producer, of course, at Muppets and uh, originally worked on the Muppet show. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'd like you to come to Vancouver to shoot Muppet Wizard of Oz. And I'm like, uh, well, do you have any idea what I'm going to be doing? Well, not right now. It'll be sort of a working audition, but we'll let you know when you get here. So it was strange but excited you know because it was the real deal and but but that's really all i knew so when i got to vancouver this was all pre-covid so went to vancouver <clears throat> and i remember we were all stay, staying at the sutton place hotel in vancouver downtown and the studio was across a river over to the mainland and they were shooting at lionsgate studios and uh so the day before we were going to start production, we had a week of rehearsals and then production would start and went on for eight weeks. It was a pretty long shoot. And um, I remember the first night there, a bunch of us that were come, flown in went to have dinner together. And the first question was, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> Alan Troutman, Alice Deneen, Drew Massey, uh, Tyler Bunch. And we all said, no, <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing. But we knew that it must have been something to do with the audition. So they had to have some idea of it. So uh, Ashante, the, the singer, played Dorothy, obviously. They brought her in to, she'd never worked the puppets before. So Steve had not arrived yet. Dave had not come in yet. So we would jump in there and just help her get used to the puppets. But... Uh, time rocked on, and for a whole week, we still didn't know what we were doing. But none of us knew who we were going to be doing. 
So by that Friday, I think the shoot started on a Monday. By that Friday, uh, a member of Bill Beretta asked us all to come into a, a conference room. <clears throat> and we go in, and there on the table were all the classic characters that they had auditioned. And he just said, Ricky, pick up Scooter. I'll pick up Scooter. And then he would have everybody else pick up other characters. And he, he just turned on the camera and said, okay, let's just play. We would just walk up to camera and make stuff up. And all I could think of was 15 seconds of curtain mistress. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I would just do the same thing over and over because, you know, I had no idea. I mean, I had brought my, uh, everything that I had, like videotapes and cassette tapes to listen to in the event that I got somebody so I could practice, but I didn't know who I was going to be doing. So th then he said, okay, you're going to be doing Scooter. But it was not like, they never promised anybody you got this character for a while. It was not that at all. It's like, you're doing this for this show. Uh, nothing guaranteed beyond that. So it was, they weren't rude about it. It's just the way it was. It was just like, well, you know, so I didn't know. And, and Scooter wasn't in, Scooter was not on the shooting schedule until late, literally the last three or four days of the shoot. So I, once I found out, I had lots of time to think, to listen to Richard Hunt and to, to listen over and over and over and try to get my head in the right space. I would look at pictures of Richard with Scooter on his hand. I would everything I could do to get my head in the space. But I had only worked with Richard I could count on one hand the number of times, but uh, had great respect for him and was flattered. And same thing with Jerry's characters, you know. But uh, but that's sort of how that happened. And then once the show was over, uh, some time passed. There were some dealings with Disney that uh, some went good, some went bad. And and then at the end of the day, they ended up recasting. And uh, I think I was always told that it wasn't that I. You know, they didn't like my performance, but it was just uh, 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 Dave Rudman had been a, a, a great friend of Richard's. Richard had really taken him under his wing on Sesame Street as a young performer. And I think they had a great history together. And the decision was made that he would take over all of Richard's characters. So so I no longer did it after that. But it was it was an honor to get to do it that one time. You know? mm. And you do it very well, I will well, say. Thank you. Thanks. Mm. did my best mm. and i'm also a huge fan of uh of ashanti so i'm jealous that you guys okay. got to work yeah. together yeah i have no, she I have... was she was great and you know for somebody that had never worked with the characters it's hard to a lot of times everybody says but it's true if the performer is not comfortable with the puppets it it can show you know i thought she did a good job mm. Now, you also did a couple of seasons on Sesame Street. And, of course, we were just talking about the piano player that, yeah. um, that yeah. Tyler Bunch, you and Paul Rudolph yeah. had a hand in. Um, what's, did you do any speaking roles on the show? Because I don't remember. Yeah. Any. The, the, the funny thing is on, Ses on that show, I had the first thing I ever did for Sesame was Grandma Cookie Monster for the Sesame Beginnings Sesame right. Beginning series. I can't believe I almost forgot about that. No, one. that's okay. But that was the the first thing I ever did, and that was funny because they were. That's a whole long story, but but I I ended up getting that character, and it's weird because I had gone up to audition. They asked me to come up and audition, and it was an interesting concept. It was a very young show. I mean, that show was for even pre pre preschoolers i mean it, it's a very very young and the idea was to have a caregiver like grandma and then the baby version of the muppet classic character big bird cookie monster whoever and they were very very concerned about like making sure the babies didn't say something a baby couldn't say at that age we had read-throughs with with people with phds that would explain you know no you couldn't say that but you could do this and you know, luckily I, I was doing grandma, so it didn't matter, but, but they sort of toyed with the idea of me doing, I, I had been told I was auditioning for grandma. And when I got up there, they said, okay, now audition for baby cookie monster. And I was totally thrown off. I had not prepared for it. I was never told to prepare for it. It was terrible. I thought I just lost a job. 
we're all sitting in a room together. We're all, all the puppeteers and a little home video camera and Kevin Quash was doing the auditions and uh, Dion Nosek was a producer. And we go through this stuff and I thought, I just lost, I just totally bombed. I mean, it was like, I wasn't ready for it. So I thought, what happened? I thought I was doing grandma. So finally Kevin said, Ricky, why don't you throw grandma on? I thought, yes. So I put grandma on and Tyler Bunch was performing Cookie, who he ended up doing Baby Cookie, by the way. And he was hilarious. And he kept doing these crazy things where he was just all over grandma. And we were ad living, it wasn't scripted. And I remember having grandma look up and say, hey, stop it. He, she wore a brooch and he kept trying to put Man. it in his mouth. <laughs> and I had grandma say, oh, you don't eat my brooch. That's my best brooch. Why don't you look at the animation? Oh, animation. Look at the animation. <laughs> and Cookie, he, ah, he looked up and everybody thought that was funny. And I got the job. <laughs> nice. So I got my, the job and then they had me record the music and, you know, they pre-record all the music. And then we came in and shot for a couple of weeks. It was a lot of fun. I don't know how successful the show was, but it was a blast. I loved doing the grandma. And uh, of course, it was one of the older Cookie Monster puppets, basically in drag. Oh, you nice. know, it's just still a cookie puppet. So that was cool. And they put a they put a hoop because, you know, Cookie Monster is a big bag puppet, you know, just a big right. sack, basically. So to give her some form, they put like some hoops inside to give her a little bit of form and put a dress on her and the big bun on top. And mm. it was a blast. Nice. Now, when you did uh, the actual show, Sesame Street, like not just like the specials yeah. and the home videos, but when you did the actual show, did you get to work with any celebrities that came on? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to be terrible with names because the younger celebrities, because I'm getting older, I would not recognize. So before the day before, I would Google them. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> because what would happen is I would get on the elevator to go up and I would get in the elevator with a big star and had no idea. And they would say, good morning. I said, good morning. <laughs> and then realize when I get upstairs at the third floor that that was a huge star I was just riding the elevator with. And, um, but I, to be honest with you, I was more enamored of the people on Sesame Street that I grew up with because Roscoe Warman was still there. Maria was still, and I would call them by their stage name. You know, I kept forgetting and calling them by their, you know, character names. And they get that all the time. They say, Don't worry about oh, it. I'm sure. But, but it's so easy to do. And no matter how old you are, when you walk on the Sesame set, it's like, oh my gosh, this is just like a real place. And it was fascinating. I loved every minute of it. I know for, who was, uh, who was, see, I'm going to forget all their names. This huge story. Oh, Robin Williams was on. Uh, oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it was just a few months before he passed, but Got to be there when he was doing two-headed monster stuff. Amazing. That was cool. That was probably the most memorable for me. I remember I was dead tired and sick when he was there. And I kept having to leave the studio and go into the hall because I would have uncontrollable coughing fits. But I wanted to see him. And I would I would go in and watch him and then run out into the hall. And uh, But there were lots of... Uh, there's so many I can't remember. There was one of the guys from what, uh, not Kelsey Grammer, but the guy that played his brother. I was just about to ask you that yes. because I have been watching Frasier a lot lately. And yes. I remember when that episode had uh -huh. aired with, um, yeah. with David Hyde Pierce. And I, yes, went, that's right. Yep. That, that, was around, that was around the time I had heard from you for the first, for the first time. Yeah. And, and he I, was a really nice guy. Got to play some sh scenes where I'm assisting. The, the thing on Sesame that I, I remember the most and liked doing the most was one of the, the uh, Super Grover 2.0s. I played a moose, a Canadian moose. Oh. And he, he had a great white North accent. He, you know, he was like, sounds like Gobo. Hey. <laughs> exactly. So he, but, but that was my, the most solid character I got to do. And it was a blast, but it was a one-off, which most of those characters are. But the moose puppet was great um a little bit heavy but but he was just so much fun and i got to work of course with eric jacobson and uh stephanie debruzzo and matt vogel and that was just a dream come true to get to do a scene and have a talking a speaking character and play off of them so 
you know, nice. that was a half of day of work, but a big chunk of my memories for that show. That's amazing that you got to work on the episode with David High Pierce because that's one of my yeah. very favorites from that yeah. era, yeah. and especially since like because I, I had just gotten the complete series of Frasier the other day, and yeah. I watched that episode that episode of Sesame Street that featured him, and I thought, yeah. I wonder if Ricky was there. Thank God yeah. you brought it up. <laughs> no, I was. I was there. Uh, definitely there. Mm. Now, a lot of, uh, of, of people who are listening, uh, like I've, I've, when I announced the show, a lot of people were really interested to hear a lot about Animal Jam, which is, of course, where I grew up with you, where you got to play the big, one of the big stars, Waffle the Cow Monkey, who Paul yeah. Rudolph described as Ross Perot, basically. That's, That's how, right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that was the intention, but. Part of it was, I mean, I had... Uh obviously being from the south and that it's funny how that came about because typically of course you have to remember uh when i first started with henson the way it would generally work after i went up for the initial audition and met jane and jim is i would get a phone call and not from jane or jim but from production and they would say uh, they want you to do this character in this show and that's how it would work but after jim passed I didn't have the connections. I didn't relocate. It was a little more difficult to get work because number one, there was very little going on. I mean, it was like crickets. And obviously the company was going through very difficult times. So I was lucky really to get work. And I remember I, I thought, well, maybe I need to be a little more proactive. So I decided to call my friend, Joey Mazzarino and just say, look, what's going on? Anything, you know, I'm coming up. So I called Joey <clears throat> and he said, Ricky, you won't believe, he said, I just left an audition for a character that you should be. He said, call them now, call them now. <laughs> and I didn't typically do that. I mean, that was just kind of like, really? Is that kosher, you know? He said, yeah, call them now. So I did, I called the office and I, you know, that's how I ended up getting the, the initial audition was calling the office. This is before cell phones. This is when you had the yellow pages and a phone with a cord on it. So I called and it turns out that I can't remember who I spoke with, Joe Roddy or Howie Stanford, who's a producer from LA. And uh, they said, look, we, they had, the reason they were auditioning, my understanding was, I think originally maybe Drew Massey was going to do the character and then he, had another job come up so they're doing some recasting it was not like they just went oh ricky's it it just was like all of a sudden <clears throat> two or three people were unavailable and boom the timing was perfect and I, but i still had to audition and they hadn't even finished building the main puppet they had a mock-up and i called and i said look i just uh, i just bought a new computer with a sound with a that i could record on and edit on literally in the same room I'm sitting in. And I said, if you'll send me the puppet, do you need me to fly up? No, no, just stay there. We'll ship you the puppet. Do your demo. They sent me a script, sent me a couple of songs. And in this very room here, I'll never forget it. My computer was not even finished. My friend was building it. I said, I oh, have wow. to finish it tonight because I have to shoot and edit tonight. <laughs> and so he literally puts my computer together and stays with me to help me shoot. They sent me the, the demo uh, 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 waffle puppet and I shot all the recorded material. I, sh I hung a black tarp up in here and shot it. And I decided to have some fun with it. Uh, is it Peter Gabriel that did uh, Shock the Monkey? Uh, I'm not sure. Da, 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 da there's a song it's called shock the monkey and i did a dance with waffle to shock the monkey and it's very silly and then i did the stuff they asked me it's very silly and he had these little noodly legs you know with the cowboy boots and i shot his legs like doing little feet moves and edited the thing together shipped it off and they call and said you're hired nice so and you totally so they, fit the role <laughs> so and it was not a big stretch for me. I've got a Southern accent and, and it, it doesn't take much to get there, but he was a lot of fun. And the show, you know, the show was on um, Animal Planet. Is that right? 
I remember it being on TLC. They had a kid's okay. block. Gotcha. They, they moved it around a little bit, but it, it was a show that was in a way before its time. It, it was great fun to shoot. It was the first time I worked with Leslie Carrera. It was first time that I worked with Howie. Um, the other puppeteers were John Kennedy. Uh, and she, uh, Andy John Tertaglia and, and Andy Stone. Yes. So, and Allison Mork was on it for a while too. She was fun to work with, uh, but it was a blast. The shooting show was so much fun, but it was really, I mean, we powered through over 20 pages a day. We shot in Florida and we did, um, we did a, a read through in the morning and then went to stage. We did two songs a day. Leslie would have a song. I would have a song that all had hand motions. We'd have to learn the choreography mm -hmm. every day and then do the songs two to three times each all the way through. One time in front of the green screen, one time on the floor with actual kids from Disney World that were visiting, and then usually maybe a third time. So it was exhausting. They actually hired a masseuse to come in and give us private, like massage our arms. Cause I would, my hand would just seize up. Yeah. But it was so much fun. Mm. It was a blast. Mm. And my first main character in a show too. So. Mm. Awesome. It's it's so funny because uh, you also played Bag on Big Bag, and that's basically the title character, but he's not even the star. That's right. That's right. Really? Shelly was the star, but Bag uh, was a fun. I loved how abstract Bag was. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Somebody was wondering, and uh, as was I, what are some of your favorite waffle songs? Oh, my gosh. See, I'm going to remember any. Let me show how old I am. <laughs> Star Hopper, Star Jumper was one. Uh, let me think. I don't remember a specific favorite. I just do remember the, the couple that did all the songs were incredible. They'd done a lot of work for Disney and uh, they were just remarkable and a lot of fun to work with because the first thing you do is record the songs. You know, I went out to California to a recording studio and worked with with this uh, couple that work together as lyricist and uh, uh, also as doing music together. And they were great. Their names are slipping me again, but, but whoops, your piece fell out, but they were, they were a lot of fun. Mm. <clears throat> I, I did a little bit of digging, uh, getting ready for this. And mm -hmm. I actually found, I forgot I had this an animal jam DVD. Yes, I remember they came out with a couple of those. Oh, Shake a Leg. I remember that song. <laughs> yeah. Or as DJ number three put it, Shake an Egg. <laughs> because right, yeah. he was just a big dunce. <laughs> that's right. That was John Kennedy. <laughs> Actually, I think he was DJ one. Oh, that's right. He was the yeah. panda, whichever yeah. one that was. Mm, I Yeah. I did ask John Kennedy once, uh, how did you get DJ one? And he said, well, I played Waffle for the pilot. And then because he I did. was puppet captain, me being yes. the lead DJ made sense. That happened. And again, like I say, it went through, I think, Drew Massey, then John, and then me. So it was, it was sort of back and forth. But yeah, but it was a fun show to work on together. Amazing. Uh, before I get to fan questions, finally, people are sending me fan questions. It's about time. I, <laughs> I, I asked and you guys answered. I hardly mm -hmm. ever get these. But um, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about your work with Magnetic Dreams. Uh, mm -hmm. For a show like this one called Nostalgia Talk, one thing that comes to mind is the 50th anniversary special for Sesame Street, where you did, uh, you were credited as creative director for the animation at the end, which was just the classic animated Sesame Street segments. What was right. that? Well, that was a lot of fun. They called us again. We, we've been working on their specials for the last several years. And when this show came up, uh, they had some ideas about how to do the open and the close, really. And I can't remember. I think they showed a few animated bits, uh, retro, retrospect kind of stuff. And they did this. They redid the song about going to get butter and bread or milk, whatever, at the store. They did that song. Oh, yeah. Again. A loaf of bread, a container y yes. of milk, and a stick, yeah. stick of butter. But the others, they really didn't have. We thought, well, what's a way that we could honor the animations? Um, and we thought, wow, why don't we 
put them in the credits. You know, let's let's have those characters. So we did some research and we looked at all the. Obviously, I had several in mind: the Alligator King, uh, the the alien with the the hair. I think she had nine eyes or whatever. The Martian Beauty. The Martian Beauty. And there are all these classics that everybody could think of and a few that were a little harder for me to remember, but we did research and it was, we couldn't really use the actual animations. We had to recreate it. Oh, and the little uh, teeny weeny super guy. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Teeny teeny little super guy. Yeah. So what we decided, we picked, we went back and forth with Sesame and decided which animated characters we wanted to recreate. And in one, a couple of cases we wanted to, integrate the new characters for example teeny weeny super guy we did some cups because it was 2d animation everything we did stylized and we put all the new care you know all big bird ernie bird excuse me all on the cups and did that we did mm-hmm. uh we tried to mix new characters with the old characters and um it was just a lot of fun it was a lot of fun nostalgic and and trying to get the make sure the designs match as much as possible the one we weren't we didn't have the budget or the time to do the uh is it the king of eight i saw the king of eight in there yes Uh, we did the king of eight but we couldn't do it stop motion the original uh, king of eight was stop motion and jim did it jim henson right it was king of eight you know the little guy comes up at the end you know the little jester at the end of we we would have loved to have done it from the queen a new baby as i have seen and she (laughs) is well and doing fine good grief it's princess number nine oh geez you got an incredible memory so we need (laughs) to have a brain transplant but Uh, but that we ended up doing stylized versions of that one and michael lipinski the art director of been did a great job and our animation team i don't do those myself I, i primarily do storyboards and design work to to get it started and then I tend to step away. But but that it was a lot of fun. We ended up getting an Emmy for it, which was really cool. But it, you oh, know, in no. a way, in a way we we always felt like it it was uh really a tribute to those animators, you know, mm-hmm. and it would have been nice if we'd been able to somehow uh I don't know if they in the credits they credited uh the original animators or not but obviously it was a tribute more than anything Mm. i really liked at the start the uh lost boy on the bike and the yo-yo guy Uh, yes that was uh one of the most psychedelic pieces of animation that is bizarre and we looked at that we were trying to figure out the best way to get into the animation and the credits and i remembered seeing that guy we were watching oh and i said that is the most bizarre yes it is 1960s early 70s thing but you know that very well may be the same company that did the uh, pinball stuff. It is. Uh, it's just the same studio. The only change we had to make, and this is just a, a nerdy thing, we recreated the little boy on the bicycle and, of course, the frog-looking guy that has a yo-yo. But we had to put a safety helmet on the boy. <laughs> Good call. Good call. Uh, that, because uh, back then they didn't do those things. So they mm. said, oh, research said, you know, we got to put a helmet on him. Mm. So we did. But yeah, around that time that uh, that the uh, special had aired, I actually took a look at that segment. And before one of my classes, we always played picture charades. Yeah. So I drew that little guy that well, not little that yeah. frog looking guy, the yo-yo man. And my class sees that they're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's freaky, even by today's standards. Well, you, are, fun, you, are you familiar with the Sesame Street cartoon that um, is has gotten quite a big cult following on the internet. Uh, I think it was called Crack Master. Mm-mm, okay, so. it was. Uh, there's a podcast on it if you'd like to check it out. Oh, but basically, okay. Base. Uh, I'll send it to you. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. There was there was a cartoon that um was that was aired in the 70s and became rare afterwards. Uh-huh. And a lot of people about 35 years later were posting online. Anybody remember this thing on Sesame Street? Something like the Crack Monster or something. Uh-huh. And uh, a lot of people were like, oh, my God, I can't find this thing anywhere. Thank- it's so good that somebody else remembers it. Eventually, somebody got their hands on it but wasn't allowed to show it. There, mm-hmm. And then somebody else got their hands on it, and now that is on YouTube. And that's pretty creepy, too. Okay, I have to check that one out. 
Yeah, if I don't, I don't. No one knows who made it. No one knows who found it. And for a while, it seems to have been kept behind closed doors. But it, it's mm-hmm. a pretty interesting story. I'll send you the podcast. Uh, so, uh, what are you working on right now? We are working on the new season of Elmo's Not Too Late Show. Oh yeah, we're doing right. graphics for that. There's not a lot of animation, but just uh, random graphics for the show. We are going to be doing. Uh, some 3D animation for a couple of episodes in the upcoming season. Oh, nice. So we're doing that. And those are one-off. You know, we do occasionally in some of the street scenes, they'll need some animation or, or we're doing some 3D Muppet ants uh, for a couple of scenes where they needed a bunch of ants running around. Uh, they use puppets most of the time, but occasionally we'll do a duplicate. So we're doing that. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else. Uh, we're doing, uh, some backgrounds for a Sesame episode, a Goldilocks episode that looked like an illustrated book. Ooh. So we're doing that. Uh, but yeah, we're doing other projects. You know, we do other stuff for other, other places too. So we're doing 2d animation. We do 2d animation, 3d special effects, local commercials, uh, industrials. We do work for Dell computer. You know, I don't work on all of that, but you know, it's, uh, but we're very busy. We've been very fortunate to stay busy through the pandemic. <clears throat> very glad that Sesame's back in to work and finishing up. They finished shooting Not Too Late Show in a week or two. And then the, I don't know when oh. the new season starts shooting, but we're usually involved with that. And uh, so, yeah, so it's a great way to stay in touch with everybody at Sesame. Awesome. Now, before I get to fan questions, I have a funny little question for you. You told me a while ago that your son used to play hockey. Are you guys fans of the Predators? Yes. Yeah. See, we used to do, um, Magnetic used to do animation for the Jumbotron at the arena. Oh, nice. So we would, the Predators are really cool, uh, saber tooth cat logo. And we used to do all the animation. And that's actually even before I started, I've been at Magnetic now 20 years. And the first thing I saw that they had done was the Predators animation. And what they would do when I first started working there, we would do the animations and they would do what's called a trade deal where they would pay for the animation, but also give free tickets to the staff. So every game we had two free tickets and we all take turns going. So that's how Andrew fell in love with Predators. We, he and I would go to the games nice. and this was all pre nine 11. So you could actually go downstairs and get the signatures at the locker room and all that. So we'd do the, watch the game and then get, the fans are crazy here in Nashville. They love the predators and we would go down and he would get autographs like uh, Thomas Falcon and he, the, all the big stars. And that was when he was very young. Now he's 26, <laughs> but that's, that's you know, that awesome. was how, how that started. Because I remember you had told me that, and it was actually the year that the Predators went to the finals against yeah. against fellow Nova Scotian Sidney Crosby. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. here's some knowledge for some of you. Uh, if any of you listeners out there are big hockey lovers, my mom taught Sidney Crosby how to skate. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. It's funny. Nobody, nobody believes me when I tell them that. Mm. Well, Andrew played uh, roller hockey, and then he went to ice, and he played – his school did not have a lot of the surrounding area does did not have hockey rinks. So unless you're in the downtown Nashville area, it's hard to have time on the ice. So he ended up in a junior league in Nashville and he played in that league for a few years until he had a stress fracture. He had a stress fracture in one of his legs, but he was a forward and he loved it. But he, once he hurt his leg and he was sort of, uh, we had to make a decision as to whether he was just playing it for fun or for a career and with a stress fracture and, and travel hockey was expensive and time consuming. And he decided not to do it anymore, but, but he had a ball. He really enjoys it. And he's still a really good skater. That's great. All right. So let's wrap it up with some fan questions. Yeah. These all come from somebody by the name of Samuel Warwick. And from what I've seen in these, he seems to be a big animal jam fan. Yeah. And he wants to know what was one of your favorite episodes that you worked on? Oh gosh. You know, I always thought it was fun whenever there was some contraption. I can't remember the name of the episode. I know he had a thing he strapped on his back with a big propeller on it. 
was trying to go to the moon or to the stars or something. That was fun. Wow. Uh, the songs were always fun. They were hard, but you would have an assistant. I would usually we have either John Kennedy, I think, or Andy Stone or John Tartaglia, because I'm not a very good dancer. <laughs> and so I would, I would do the body move and have somebody else do his arms. Those were always a challenge. And I would always, I would ask Leslie to let me do mine after lunch because that way I could practice during lunch. And right as soon as lunch was over, I could just go get it over with it. Cause I was always like, Oh no, can I remember these moves? Mm. But they were fun. They looked really good when it worked. Mm. Uh, Samuel is also asking how fun was it to work with both Spencer Locke and Thea Cabreros, who were two of the girls on that show. I guess they're really famous now or something. Really? They yeah. must have been. Now, were they, uh, this is a question, Spencer. Now, Animal Jam, was he talking about Animal Jam or Big yep. Bag? Animal Jam. Those names, were they dancers on the show, like kid dancers? Apparently, I've never heard of them. See, I, don't, were, I don't think they were ever credited. The thing is, they there were kids on the show that were cast that were professional actors and actresses that could dance and they would put them up on these dance platforms everybody else was literally brought in from the park mm -hmm. kids that were at the park that day they put a t-shirt on them and teach them the basics of the moves and then go <laughs> and that was what happened after lunch so those i'll have to what are the names again uh, Spencer Locke. Uh, Locke is spelled L-O-C-K-E. Okay. And Thea Cabreros. Uh, Cabreros is C-A-B-R-E-R-O-S. I have to look that up because that, that may very well. I can't get to it, but there's a picture on the wall over here. Maybe Spencer. That may be Spencer because one of the kids was a huge Waffle fan, and I think he may have been Spencer. If that's the case... I mean, a fan on the show, and it may have been him, a okay. blonde-haired kid. Of course, he's probably in his 20s or 30s now, but okay. yeah. But they were great. Everybody was great on the show. Mm. What was the first and last episode of Animal Jam that you remember filming? First and last? The last thing I filmed was the opening uh, of the show. Oh, really? Last, yeah, we filmed it last because I remember being on green screen and there's this picture of me that's a terrible picture that's all over my Muppet world. Yeah, it's, uh, the, me it's, the, it. it's the one that I used right at the start of the video. <laughs> that's okay because it's, it was like the only one. I don't have a good picture of me with Waffle. Well, actually, I do somewhere here. But, but that picture was me. I had one of those beekeeper green hats on and it was very hot and I pulled it back and I looked like, I don't know. You look like you were wearing a beret. <laughs> I, I look like I have a green beret. But yeah, that and I've got waffle on my arm because we were doing the dances. You know, we were doing the opening and him hanging on the logo. You mm -hmm. know, we're swinging on the logo. That was the last thing we shot. I don't remember the first thing. We always had read throughs. I mean, the first thing we would do is read throughs and then we'd go in and do the show. And some of those directors too were Sesame people, you know, people that had worked on Sesame. Mm. So it was a nice little connection then. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah. And that of course, picture. the puppets were all built by the shop, uh, the Henson shop. Mm. And I will also add that that picture of you with Waffle, yeah. uh, all decked out in green, yeah. you're in my contacts in my phone. That's the picture I used for you. <laughs> that, that's okay. I'm not offended. That's okay. Uh, no, I love that picture. It's my favorite photo of you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Final question. Can you do the Waffle voice? Yes, indeedy, Edie. <laughs> Little cow monkey buddy here. <laughs> uh, <Wahoo. laughs> wow, that, that's amazing. And uh, Samuel, I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, uh, so, Ricky, thanks again for taking the time to, uh, yeah. to chat and get nostalgic. Well, thanks. It's so nice to talk to see you in person. Man, you, you know your stuff. I yeah, wish I, I had your memory. I still remember the first message I got from you, which was, um, it's a, I'm amazed at how much you know about the Muppets. You probably know more than most of us do. And a lot of guests have confirmed that. So That's true. if you, if you want to place true. bets on it, I'm, 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 I'm available for no, that. You, you win. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, big thank you to my friend and mentor, Ricky Boyd, for coming on Nostalgia Talk today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And stay tuned because next up is a Sesame Street legend, writer Emily Pearl Kingsley. And oh, then cool. and then after that is Ricky's Animal Jam co-star, Leslie Carrera Rudolph. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. So if any of you have any questions that you'd like me to ask Emily or Leslie, just send me a message and I will put them in the Q&A. So I'll see you next week. Peace. Thank you. See ya.